There's so many people that will come to you and they will say, I want to look like Rihanna. I want this. I'm like, you don't want to look like Rihanna. You want what Rihanna feels like when you see Rihanna. In 2002, a 20-year-old pre-med student in Chicago had an idea. Jason Bolden had come to the Windy City from his hometown of St. Louis with plans to follow an admirable but conventional professional family footsteps. However, after landing a luxury retail gig revealed an uncanny eye for style and an undeniable gift of gab, he set out to forge a career in fashion. Jason would relocate to New York City and launch a pop-up vintage shop in Soho that would put him on the radar of actress Gabrielle Union. Then, a chance turn of events would land the upstart sartorialist with an opportunity to actually style her. Now, a decade later, he has ascended from magpie thrifter to the go-to stylist for Hollywood A-listers. From Michael B. Jordan and Dwayne Wade to Angelina Jolie and Nicole Kidman, Jason has cornered the market on stars who aspire to have their clothes tell a deeper story. And it all started with one idea. How would you say that your parents' professional life informed your ambitions? My mother is an educator. My father was all things. My grandparents were physicians and chefs. There was some creativity there. So it, it helped support me in so many different ways when I think of being an artist or loving art, they allowed me to kind of explore, but also gave me these messed up American ideas of boundaries. I was able to kind of like juggle art, but also have these boundaries of like, how are you going to pay your bills? Do you see sort of the things that you saw in the house playing out in your professional life every day now? I come from a place where my mom was never really truly fashion oriented. She was more interior oriented. She did this really interesting thing where like she would transition seasons with our house. When it turned into fall, the house shift, the color shift, the paints on the wall shift, the pillows on the sofa shifted. In the summertime, things got lighter, things got brighter, things got softer. And I realized for me in my life, that particular thing that I never knew would breathe anything into my, my work, I see it every day. I adjust with clients. I adjust with what's happening in the planet. I adjust when I go to different parts of the world. So those type of adjustments, I never really knew it would like penetrate and add to my work. As a teenager, you got into skating. Mm -hmm. What was it about skate culture that drew you in? Growing up skating, it was just like the coolest thing to kind of just get away and, and and it was just so fast. I was able to go places very, very fast and get to see things outside of just my neighborhood. And I was able to go into this particular neighborhood, which was called the, the U City Loop in St. Louis, Missouri. Very alternative, super like edgy, cool, weird, as people would probably call it back then. There was a tattoo artist and there was like piercings there. And it was just like, I got to see a range of different type of people that I would only see in magazines or on television. So for me, the skate culture allowed me to experience just art and life. I think my ultimate creative goal is to give access and arts to people who don't have access or the availability to, you know, travel, touch and feel, smell and eat what art is about. You mentioned seeing icons on TV and in magazines. What are the sort of styling moments that had you stuck as, as a teenager? Mine were like all across the board. And again, growing up in a household in the Midwest and having like really kind of interesting, but still yet conservative parents and people around you. Like I grew up watching, for example, Sidney Poitier to Surf With Love. And I would watch this super chic and just smart and smooth black man in London teaching these kind of like 
bad, horrible <laughs> British kids and just watching how smooth he was and watching how like put together he was. And then on the other side of it, I would watch things like Nirvana, Nine Inch Nails, Rage Against the Machine. And I would see that type of vibe and just kind of how like not put together, but so put together they were. And then on the other hand, I would see stuff like Tony Braxton, who was like, for me, was the beginning of me understanding fashion and such like this visual hype Williams vibe of the time and just seeing this woman being so styled. In the 2020s, people having like a very broad swath of uh, influences is totally normal. In 1994, 1995, it definitely, the world was not quite like that. How were you being received from the family and fr from people around you outside for having such an eclectic set of uh, influences? Everybody thought it was weird. Like I, like I was the epitome of code switch. I was super popular in high school. So I had friends across the board, right? Some days I would, I would hang out with the golf kids, my skater friends, the jocks, the cool kids. Like I was able to like live in all those spaces. And for my, I can use my brothers for an example, they would be like, yo, what, huh? Like they would, they would hear me playing certain stuff in my room, like, why are you listening to Savage Garden? But at the same time, I'm the first person who can tell you everything Nas has ever done. So I think for me, it was just like, it was a blessing at the same time. I was really lucky that I grew up in a space where like acceptance was like just a thing. Like that's just what we did. When you graduated, you went to Northwestern mm -hmm. and you were pre-med to start. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty far cry from where you've ended up. So far. So far, <laughs> yes. What was your interest in medicine and how did you decide to pivot? I never really had an interest in medicine. I grew up in a space where everybody was a doctor, attorney, an uh, educator, a cop, or it was very quintessential. My godfather is a heart surgeon. He was the coolest guy, he had the coolest Rolex, he had a, the most amazing red Porsche, and he was just like smooth. So I, in my head, I was like, okay, I could kind of still live in this world of like coolness, but I didn't know anybody who worked in fashion. That wasn't a thing. The closest thing I thought about was fashion was the person who worked at Neiman Marcus Dillard's or JC Penney's in St. Louis. So I had to lean into what felt still cool or had some type of um, sparkliness to it. And I wanted to go to a place that was still close enough, but far enough, which was Chicago. A lot of people don't know this, it was like, one of the leading spaces in fashion. My biggest and earliest supporter would probably be a group of friends that I curated in college in Chicago. It was a group of us who just kind of like just dreamed. And it was really helpful to have people around you who kind of understood the space and the opportunity of dreaming. What was it that happened, you know, when you got to school that sort of gave you that confidence to step out of the pre-med program and to switch to the arts? I got to Chicago a week early. I was going to go spend my only $500 that I was supposed to have, it was supposed to stretch me out for food. I went into a store and I bought a designer backpack and it was $475 in tax. It was like I had to take out cash to pay the rest. And I saw this girl walk in with a Louis Vuitton Steven Sprouse pochette. And she started talking to me about art school that she was at. And that stuck with me. And I would go to school and I would just daydream. And then eventually one day I just said, you know what? Excuse my French. Fuck it. I wanna I wanna try this this art thing. Still had no clue what a stylist was, a creative director, never knew what that was. And I start hanging out with more art people and then they start talking about fashion and design. And that's kind of what triggered me to just take a leap of faith and hopefully not be killed by my parents. But <laughs> that's where I landed. I didn't tell them and- You didn't tell your parents? I didn't tell them, I just stopped. I just stopped. They were still paying, but then I stopped. And then eventually I told them and it wasn't received well at all. It's that classic, you know, American fear of like, you have to do this. We know this works. All that fear, all that did was constantly push me to, to do and try things. And 
it was all trial and error. I worked at so many luxury, you know, retail from Saks to Cynthia Raleigh to Nicole Mill. It was just like, I worked at all of them. I don't know if I believe in luck. I think I believe in timing. And I don't know if that's the same thing or it's a different thing, but for me, my whole career has been based on being at the right place at the right time. So I don't know if that's luck, but I lean into time. What were the most instructive things that you learned selling luxury goods? People don't know what they want. People don't buy products, they buy a feeling that you give them. And I realized that by working in all those places. I was like, wow, people aren't going coming to these stores to show up to buy like the cool clothes. Like that's the bonus. They're showing up for this relationship and these, these feelings that I give them. I realized there was this space of like charisma and ease that I had when it came to talking to people and romancing people. I realized very early on, it was more about romance. I've just always kind of been able to read a room and just kind of know what that person wants, what that person needs, what that person missed out on yesterday. I was able to actually like, I could reignite that, that pain. And then by the time they leave me, everything that, that happened that past day that was no and it was the trauma, I was able to like smooth it over and like now we're in paradise. Were there any experiences in particular that you think sort of uh pulled that out of you as a child, as a teenager? I grew up in a, like a super, not, and I, when I say conservative, I don't mean in like views and rights. I just mean conservative as in the sense of like classic Americana way of picture perfect situation like that. But I also grew up as internally as an artist, internally as completely different than my siblings and also gay. The way I wanted to show up is like, I had to make sure that I was, everybody else around me felt good. As traumatic as it possibly sounds, it actually helped me adjust to me. And then everything, everybody else is secondary, you know? So yeah. through those years of like adjusting, adjusting, making sure everybody feels good, I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. If everybody adjusts to me, I'm chilling. I used to believe that talent was the most important thing. Now I realize that it's not. It's about circumstances, it's about passion, and it's about hustle. You leave school and you move to New York mm -hmm. and you open a vintage store mm -hmm. down in Soho. How did you put that together as a you know 20-something where did you get the inventory from and, and the oh, startup capital and all that kind of stuff? I had no startup capital. I was selling vintage clothes in Chicago. I would go to this vintage store on the south side of Chicago and I would go in there and give you a trash bag. Anything you can put in a trash bag for $25. And initially I would just go there and be like, I just want some cool, I just need some, I need some old Levi's. And I would go and then one day I went and I saw, I'll never forget, I saw Gucci Shirley. And I was like, what? And I was like, okay, put it in the bag. Then I just started to, now I would go strictly, I would go look through clothes from the top of the hanger and I would just push back. And this way, all you're seeing is the labels. So I would see Asi Clark, Issey Miyake, Dior, Gucci, blah, blah, blah. And I would just, throw, I wouldn't even look. I just saw the labels, I would just throw them in. I would get them back to my apartment. I would look at them, I'm like, oh, this would be fresh. Like, what if I just cut this, like made it short, just make, bring it to life, make it more modern. And then I start selling and I would have people over, we would just drink and they, I mean, I'm selling stuff for like 10 to $35. So one day, one of my friends was like, let's go to New York. Let's just like go to a flea market and set up a flea market. Cut to, we get there, we set up a flea market. It's whack. It's off of like West Side Highway and um, Hell's Kitchen, like random. And it was whack. So we, we walk in in Soho and Long story short, we call this number, this kid picks up, and it's the son of the owner of all the buildings. And you can tell he's like, party kid. He was like, you, get, you got $1,500, you can, you, can you can rent the space for the weekend. We get the space, so we're setting up, doors open, people are walking past. Music is, you know, we like listening to music, music blasting. And people are like, oh, what is this place? I don't know this place. 
and I'm just like, oh word, like, and I, I, I see it. It's like Meg, right? Like it's everyone walking. I'm like, holy, I'm just like, okay, so the uh, two hundred dollars. They're like, oh, okay, cool. I'm like, oh shit, like this is wild. Uh, uh, one hundred and fifty. Oh sure. Uh, five hundred. Uh, oh cool. By Sunday, we made seventy five thousand dollars. Holy shit. And that was it. And we basically were the first people to coin pop-up shop. And then eventually I began to meet people. Vogue wrote as it was like the models hang out. Like all the cool kids, the downtown cool kids would come and they would just hang out and we would have alcohol there. Probably shouldn't have that, but everybody would come and they would like drink and hang out. And like, and then all of a sudden there would be people from like Ralph Lauren just walking down the street and then they would stop in. And then they would be like, what is this place? And then all of a sudden, we began to do design inspiration for those companies. With an initial entree into the upper echelons of New York fashion secured, Jason set out to learn the nuances of the styling trade. His ability to make authentic connections with people would also provide the basis for pivotal friendships that would give him the platform to present his storytelling-driven sartorial eye to a worldwide audience. As you're doing this, what were you thinking as far as your career? Like, did you have any sort of like medium or long-term goals or sense of like where this was going? Or was it just like, yo, this, we're making money. This is amazing. It was literally, we are making so much money and I'm going out every night. I got to be around clothes. I got to be around fashion. I got to like meet these most incredible people in New York City who would tell me all these fantastic stories. There was never a moment where I was thinking about what was next because I was so full. What was that like coming from, you know, St. Louis? And obviously you get a taste of it in Chicago. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was wild. Like first meeting Rihanna. I mean, like meeting Rihanna who's coming in like, whoa. And then also there's moments where like, I'm talking about the height of Lindsay Lohan. I got to witness like, in real time, what people were saying, like the Us Weekly and the People Magazine, <laughs> the high, like seeing people being chased by paparazzi. New York was a magical fashion moment for me. In that period, you meet Gabrielle Union, mm -hmm. become friends, and she inadvertently ends up sparking yes. what would become your styling career. Gab and I become really good friends, and she uh, she goes, are you going to Art Basel? And I'm like, um, oh, I'm not really gonna go. She was like, you should come, you should come. And I'm like, all right, cool. And she was like, well, bring me something to wear. And this is just like friend conversation. Like, all right, cool, I'll bring you some stuff. I got a bunch of stuff. And she goes to this event and she wears the, this like multicolored polyester lambon, like kind of like hostess with the most distress. And it was just in my head, it was just like, I'm just helping a friend, we're going out that night. A couple of days later, it's on Vogue. And then it says, Jason Bolden, purveyor of style. I was like, huh, what, huh? Like, what is happening? And it kind of snowballed into that. And all of a sudden, like, I was like, oh, I, I'm a stylist. What are the qualities about yourself that you hold on to the most tightly? With growing, there's change and there's adjustments. But there are certain things that I hold deep that I refuse to adjust and those things are self-reflection, trust, and time. How would you explain to someone that knows nothing about the industry what a stylist does? A stylist is someone who curates and creates identities and looks. So at some point in your career, you have a fashion profile. And what a fashion profile is, is you can look at it as a, a playlist, right? Every time you go to a song, like that, that's, that song is for happy, that song is for sad, that song is a party song, that song is to get a little rough. Your fashion profile is the exact same thing. People can look at it and be like, wow, that person can do glamor. Wow, that person can do edge. Wow, that street style. Wow, that's like, you know, sporty and cool. So a stylist helps you curate and create a fashion profile. A lot of people only see the, the end. That's the glossy, pretty finale, right? But before you get to that, there's so many different things that happen. A, the, the, the minor, 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 minor first step thing is the talent has to be going to something, 
right? <laughs> so <laughs> that has to happen. So when that happens, you have to figure out what that carpet looks like, what that moment looks like, and you start working backwards from that. So then you send out requests, hoping that someone's gonna respond to you and say, yes, I would love to dress that person. You just send them all out. You get a response, you do that, you set up a fitting, right? You get the fitting together and you do the fitting with the client. And what a lot of people don't understand is in those particular moments, that's when your magic has to happen. Because now you have to convince a client to understand your point of view and why your point of view is so valuable and why it's gonna transcend outside of just a carpet into a campaign or you know, money while you sleep, if you will. And then once you go through that particular process, they wear it, you hope you get good publicity off of it, and it kind of becomes a snowball effect. And then people kind of, by word of mouth or by just imagery, people reach back out to you. What was the process for you not knowing, you know, when you started this, any of these details that we've just shared? What was the process of discovery? It was sad. It was really sad once I started to like get into things and realize because I started my business off still like pulling from my archives of vintage stuff or going to Barney's and, and Neiman's and Saks and Bergdorf and buying stuff on my own personal credit card because I thought that's how it was supposed to go. It was horrible, but I would buy things, put it on clients and then return it. Like I would literally have bought like a tag gun to re-tag clothes because I also had this idea of like, they need to be in this in order to be received a particular way. But I didn't know any of it. I kept, I, I went for a very long time not knowing. And then one day I, 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 I started gathering enough funds and I got an assistant who worked for a really big stylist. And she came in and she did everything. <laughs> she was like, oh, you don't know this person? Oh, you don't, oh, we're gonna send it. So when, when is the fit day? And, this, and she was like, da, 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 da. she was doing everything. And I was like, oh no, what is happening? So that's how I learned everything. When you think back to that period of really making that transition from being a vintage retail guy to a celebrity stylist, what were the most consequential clients that you added and, and also looks that you put together? And what were the things that really kept pushing the dominoes over. Oh, wow. I did Taraji P. Henson for the Oscars for Hidden Figures. That particular moment was the initial stamp for Hollywood approval. And that shifted everything. That was one of those big, 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 big moments. And I think about like my client Yara Shahidi and being able to like do a lot of those things that most people never get to do, being at one point a Chanel girl, a Prada girl, and now a Dior girl. There was this point in time where like stylists, particularly black stylists, only had the capability of working with black talent that, you know, reached back for them or, or wanted them. But now I'm in a space where like, I have people like Angelina Jolie, Nicole Kidman. It's a beautiful shift and to kind of see that. And when those people decide to use their fashion privilege and give me a platform or support me, you see the doors open in a very different kind of way. While you definitely embrace these new opportunities with these huge mainstream white Hollywood talents, it's also very important to you to maintain sort of your foundation. Oh, that's my foundation. Exactly. I, oh, listen, you know, I like, what? Let's just always be completely clear and transparent. The only reason where I am where I am is because of black women. And the reason that I will always work and forever work will be because of black women. That is it. Fortunately, and nice that I get to work with everyone now, which how it should be. We should be able to work with everybody. You should show up with talent and work. That is it. Well, Jason looks like he can do this job. Amazing. Sure, you can work with whoever. But to be completely clear, I will always and forever be indebted to Black women because I will always and forever work because of Black women. That is a fact. You mentioned Taraji, and I know that she was, like Gab, among your earliest supporters, and also that she played a serious role in sort of like helping you to make that transition. Mm -hmm. How did she end up 
putting that battery in your back. I, I met Taraji by accident. I was going to Sanaa Lathan's house and she was there and I met her. And then one day, all of a sudden, I get a call and I, I, I do her for a campaign or commercial or something. And it just kind of happened. And, you know, fortunately, I got to work with somebody while they were on their journey, right? Like every, every time, and I say this to all the kids that I talk to, when your client goes to a place, if they're nominated for Oscar, an Emmy, a Globe, a Grammy, Critics' Choice, whatever, you're nominated. Because that is also your particular moment as a creative to actually show your work and you're showing up. And she allowed me for every one of those carpets to show my capability and show that like, oh, 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 he can do, oh, wow, that's amazing. So she's like, she gave me free reign. And she was like, I trust you, do it. I've been lucky from then to now to have clients who still allow me to kind of, to do those things. I think of Yara at the Met and she wore like, we did this reference of like Josephine Baker who left America to go to Paris. Yara wore a version of this couture Dior dress. Those images are like breathtaking and you walk into, I walk into shoots sometimes and I see the image on people's mood boards. Do I ever get creatively blocked? I think I'm constantly creatively blocked and I think that gives me space and opportunity to create new and interesting things. I think from a space of nothing, you seem to come up with more interesting and connective things. It's funny you say that about Yara and Taraji and her rise, and I, I think about this, and this goes a, a, across a lot of creative disciplines where you're working with talent. When you're growing up and you're a young person in the industry, you're looking at the stars of today and the people who work with them, and you, you want to be there. But as, as you're sort of speaking to, like, it's actually to get there, the key is to identify the that person of tomorrow and to create those relationships and to be a part of that movement because you and they will both arrive together. Yes. I think that's I think that's a really interesting, you know, topic. Everybody wants to go straight to the finale. Everybody wants to be right there. And if you are really smart and you really love this and you really want to do it and you really want to figure out how to be impactful, a lot of times you have to find people that you can start with because that's growth, that's creating trust. It may not be the most money, it may not be the person with the most visibility at that particular moment, but like this is a chance to hone in on your art and like actually truly practice. You gotta trust it and you just have to be okay with like waiting. What are the qualities that you look for in a talent? I look at how disconnected they are with fashion. I love people who don't have time to focus on your job because they're overly focused on their job. Because at that point, they don't want to. They don't want to think about that. They want to have the person in front of them that they hired, that they trust, that it, who knows them, that they can release and let go. In the world of celebrity styling. There are a finite number of stars, and I would imagine that there is some competition between stylists. Mm -hmm. But there's also collaboration. Mm -hmm. How do you think about those relationships, and how would you, if you were talking to a aspiring stylist, how to manage peer relationships? I tell anybody, I'm just like, find, like talk to people. The idea of being competitive and being combative and just being angry and upset because that person has that person or you want that job, it's like, it's enough to go around, but talk to people. Are there sort of like uh, ethical norms or like rules of engagement that stylists respect? You're not supposed to slide in another client's DM. I've had clients reach out to me and I'm friends with the, the stylist and then I'll call the stylist. Hey, heads up, this person just reached out to me. What's up with that? And if you're a solid person, you would be, most people are just like, wow, that person's wild, or blah, 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 or I knew this was coming. Actually, you would be really good for them. Or watch out, Jason, they're wild. It's also business. Nobody owns anybody. Somebody told me the most promising thing in Hollywood is that people leave you. That is a fact. People leave you. 
And I was like, wow. After seeing his work displayed on the most high profile fashion stages, Jason gained an intimate knowledge of the fickle taste and mercurial loyalties of Hollywood. But his commitment to providing depth and originality have continued to push his collaborations with his clientele and made him a true style authority for this generation of stars and the next. Is it hard to work in an environment where the value of your creativity and, and your work product is so subjective mm -hmm. and so subject to scrutiny and impression? Well, I live in, I, I, say, I say this to people in my office all the time. I live in a world where every day, I hope that somebody likes me. Every day. When I bring clothes to a client, I hope they like it. And if they like it, that means they like me. If they don't like it, that means like, oh, what did I do wrong? So that's the space that I have to live in, but then I also have to figure out in that space what makes me happy. I just try to have people in my life that like I can laugh about this beautiful chaos that I work in, and I try to find spaces where I can disconnect so I'm not jaded. Styling has this element that you can never predict how the ball is gonna bounce, mm -hmm. right? Does that make you anxious? And are, are there any in instances in your career where you are like, I felt so good about this and... I think early on in my career, I was, I was a bit more anxious about it and I would get stressed out about it. Like, is the client gonna fire me because it wasn't received? Now in my, now, right now, I have very clear conversations with clients. This particular look is for the fashion people. Everyone else on so social media is not gonna understand. They will end up purchasing this six months from now and then they will forget everything that you, that you wore and they said. So I'm very clear and some people can handle it. And some people are like, you know what, Jason? Can you just give me a Jane and t-shirt? And I'm like, okay, fine. But I also need you to understand you're not gonna track. It's not gonna do anything. And if you want something to do something, you have to do something outside of the norm. I use this, this scenario all the time. There's so many people that will come to you and they will say, I wanna look like Rihanna. I want this. I'm like, you don't want to look like Rihanna. You want what Rihanna feels like when you see Rihanna. You could probably wear the exact same thing that Rihanna wore, but it's not going to translate that way. It's like when you look, when people come to me for a shoot and they're like, we want to shoot this. We, they show you a photo, we want to shoot this. I'm like, you're not even talking about the clothes. You're talking about the mood and the vibe. It has nothing to do with the clothes, the glam, the lighting that day. It's the mood and your commitment to who you are. How do I tell a good idea from a bad idea? A good idea is scary. A bad idea is easy. What is the difference between a look and a moment? Okay, so a look is something that works. It's now, right? A moment is a moment. It's going to live and we are able to identify when, where, how, and why. A moment is Angelina Jolie in Europe in a silver Versace chainmail dress. Dwayne Wade in this beautiful custom Burberry. Michael B. Jordan in this canary yellow Virgil Abloh for Louis Vuitton. I think of a lot of things that I've done that's a moment and there's, there's a lot of looks that I've done. Probably more looks than moments because we live in a space where everything's very quick. So the moments take time. You have this very long-standing relationship with Gab, and you're around Dwayne for years and years, years and years, years, but it wasn't until about two years ago that you started styling him. Mm -hmm. How did you sort of make that transition? His transition into this new version of a Renaissance man. You know, he's a, an executive producer. He is an entrepreneur. He is the most amazing father. He is like all these icons and goats in all these different arenas. The transition for now was to just kind of like, and I think he does it the best, where we lean into like real luxury is leisure. Like his luxury is pure leisure and everybody wants a part of that. Everybody wants to kind of figure out how can I look this particular way, but also be so comfortable, but also, but also, but also, but also. 
So that relationship was interesting. And like, it's, it's quite special compared to my other relationships because it feels like, you know, it, it, it's, it's like a brother thing. I'm always trying to like support my, my brother to do something. There's a lot of like banter and good times and laughing. And like, we particularly don't talk as much about fashion as we talk more about style ideas. Who am I today? Is it Harry Belafonte? Is it like Miles Davis? Am I giving you full on, you know, executive producer vibe where I just want to be smooth and feel like I have a cigar? Like it's it's those type of things that which are really interesting to know that somebody who comes from being such a like an honest and known athlete to be in a space where you're almost talking to someone whose everything feels like the creative direction behind the identity of a character in a movie with him. In addition to your styling business, you also have a design studio mm -hmm. with your husband, yep. Adair Curtis, and you guys do all kinds of different projects from yeah. creative direction to interior design stuff. What is the key to operating a business with your spouse? Don't talk about work at home. We're two different separate humans. Like my point, I'm very instant. I don't think about, I don't need to sleep on anything. I just, it's yes or no. For him, it's the opposite. It's very, he has to digest it, has to do all these different things. So for us, that's the most complicated part about working together. But I guess that could be with anybody, any partner, partnership that you have. But the key for us is like, we don't, we don't talk about it. If it comes up, it's so quick and it's a shut off. It's like, hey, quick question, can you, you have this morning, can you do it? And I'm like, yes, no, and then it's, that's it. So it's only urgent questions that have to be answered. What would you say are like the least glamorous parts of being a uber elite stylist? I have a lot, but I think the, <laughs> I have a lot, I've seen a lot of weird stuff. But I think the, the one thing is like, people just don't say thank you. <laughs> You know what I mean? I think that's the that's the most bizarre thing. People don't say thank you, and it's also because it's so fast. You may feel like very thankful, but people don't say thank you enough. And it's the most bizarre thing to watch from adults. Do I have a role model whose success I hope to reach? I would probably say it's my grandmother. And also going back to being in a space where people would always say no and watching her turn her nose into on. And it helps me now as an adult that when I hear no, I don't hear it, I hear on. So I move on to other things. In addition to these, these other parts of your sort of more core business, done a lot of punditry and reality TV. How do you see that fitting into the sort of larger arc of your career? For me, it's just about more exposure. It's more exposure and it also gives you a stamp of authority. You know, I just shot Next in Fashion again, you know, the, the Netflix show, I did an Amazon. So I do all these things to, in a space of authority to kind of like, you know, walk people through and kind of let them know what it looks like on the side. Or, and sometimes it's just giving pure advice on what to do and what not to do. Do you enjoy it? I love it. it. It feels like styling. I can do it. I just, I go in and I show up and it's, it's good. And it feels like the beginning of my career when I got to meet new people all the time and just talk. So when you look at how your career has grown over the last few years, and it's really blossomed pretty dramatically in the last three or four years. Yeah, crazy. Where do you want to go? I really want to find myself at a creative director position someplace because I do it every day with brands anyway and with clients. You know, I, I really want to do like something like really interesting, like almost like bringing back United Colors of Benetton or bringing back like The Limited or Esprit or something. I want to go into something very nostalgic and do a creative direction and kind of revamp that. That for me, in my career, that is the one thing that I'm so gung-ho on, and that's what I'm working towards. 